Welcome to Canada's Social Changemakers. My name is Justin Douglas, and today I'll be in conversation with investigative journalist and environmental writer, Martin Lukacs. He was uh, working for the UK Guardian for over five years. He's been on the CBC, uh, done pieces for the TAI, for the National Observer, just to name a few. He's broken some incredible stories on government spying on First Nations, oil company cover-ups, and Canadian charities being used to militarize the police. He's the author of the Trudeau formula, Seduction and Betrayal in the Age of Discontent. He's also co-author of the Leap Manifesto. Today, he'll be speaking to me from Montreal. Thanks for being here, Martin. Thanks for having me, Justin. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement before we get started. I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, which is part of the unceded territories of the Wonkin speaking peoples, also known as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, as well as the Wasanich peoples. So thank you again very much. Uh, just to get things going, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in journalism? Well, I, I was born in Hungary. I immigrated to Canada with my family when I was five. Um, and I've kind of come to understand that, you know, being an immigrant gave me an outsider's eye and an ability to kind of see Canada's blind spots, um, which is proved useful to me as a journalist, I think. Um, I grew up in Toronto, moved to Montreal, where I became involved in social movements and worked at the student newspaper at McGill, the McGill Daily. McGill doesn't have a, a journalism degree, but we call the Daily our informal school of journalism. Um, it's not actually a daily and hasn't been a, a daily newspaper for like 70 years, but <laughs> It's, it's nurtured, I think, like a lot of pretty well-known journalists across the political spectrum, like everyone from Judy Rebick, Dan Gopnik, to Charles like, Krotheimer. Um, and uh, I think I learned a lot of the principles I still rely on um, in that like dank uh, basement, windowless basement office that we worked in, um, you know, write as clearly and excessively as possible. Um, never trust anything that people in power say and respect deeply the those on the margins and on the front lines and activists and organizers working to change things because their knowledge and insight is profound yeah i was a, a student at mcgill law while you were doing your undergrad and i used to see some of the stories that you had been publishing in the mcgill daily and i thought wow even at that time i i knew you were going to be doing some really interesting stuff. Okay. And so it's really cool to see how that process has, has gone for you. But for other people who might want to get involved in investigative journalism or environmental writing, uh, you mentioned a little bit about McGill, but how does one sort of get into the echelons of the UK and the TAI and the CBC and all these other platforms you've been involved with? Well, it's sweet of, sweet of you to say that you like my journalism um, at the, the Daily. Um, I really thought based on the kind of hate mail we used to get that... <laughs> I was universally reviled on campus. Not uh, by everyone. Uh, that's good to, good to discover uh, 15 years on. Um, how does one get, in, in, I mean, like for me, writing and journalism was always a tool to advance uh, the goals and aspirations of social movements and struggles I was involved in. Um, so, you know, that didn't mean subordinating the truth or evidence to those goals, um, but it did mean using the investigations of uh, the techniques of investigation, of description, of storytelling um, in the service of, of justice and liberation. Um, and I don't think that makes me any less, uh, any more or less an activist than journalists who work at, um, at, you know, big corporate newspapers. The only difference I think is that they tend to put journalism to the service of the status quo or, or of reaction. Um, and I think that more political understanding of journalism meant that I had a lot less time for the kind of um, like pieties and mythologies of, of journalism. Um, um, like, you know, I think one of the, um, the sacred kind of mantras of a lot of journalists is that they speak truth to power. Um, but I don't think power actually cares much about the truth. Um, I think power cares about power. And so I've personally always been more interested in, in not in speaking truth to power, but in speaking truth about power. 
right? Uh, which is a, a great phrase that I heard, um, I first heard Naomi Klein use. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's like the journalism that helps people understand, ordinary people understand how much power we actually have. Um, and so I think a lot of my journalism has attempted to clarify how power works and how uh, we, people, you know, not in the establishment can uh, acquire more of it. Um, uh, I, I, in terms of, um, in terms of like how I've, I've been able to, uh, get a platform at places like the guardian, um, you know, I, I felt, especially that when I was, must've been coming out of, coming out of university, I felt that there was, um, and had a few years of activism under my belt. And I felt that there was a real like gap when it came to investigative environmental journalism. Um, and so I started doing access to information research, which I had actually first started doing at the McGill Daily and uh, which the administration was not happy about at the time. I remember when we flooded their office with all kinds of access to information requests. And I was able to right. get a few stories in the star and then in the guardian and um, that was actually the kind of um, that was that was the way I got one one foot in the door, and then was able to then kind of broaden the 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 themes that I wrote on, and um, you know be able to kind of um, broaden the the scope of what I was working on. But really, like I for for someone like me who came out of left wing movements, um, I'm not the type of person who is traditionally published in um, mainstream papers like the Toronto Star. Um, but I thought strategically that if I can come to those papers with investigative material that they don't have themselves, they'll be forced to um, publish me. And so- <laughs> And uh, it worked. It worked, it worked, it worked really well. Um, but I think to this day, I've never had, for instance, like an op-ed published in, in those papers um, um, because I, I just think that they, they, they tend to police and uh, hold to a very narrow um, uh, spectrum of permissible opinion, uh, much more so, for instance, much more narrow, for instance, than, than you'll find in places like The Guardian. Yeah, we'll dive into that a little bit more too, I think. Um, but just some of the stories that you have been able to investigate, like spying, government spying on First Nations, uh, oil company cover-ups, where does the idea even come and how do you like get onto topics like that? Well, I think, I think a lot of the, the, the subjects I will explore are often, uh, my interest is peaked in it because they're of deep concern to social movements. So for instance, um, Tim Groves and I were, were the first to really start uh, exploring and exposing the spying and surveillance of indigenous activists. Um, and that came out of um, work that I was doing because uh, I was working with a bunch of indigenous communities in land struggle. and. Mm discovered that, um, that many of them were being surveyed by CSIS. And, um, and so I started to dig into it as a journalist and was able to uncover, for instance, that under Harper, um, there had been a, a, a pretty intensified program of, of surveillance of frontline indigenous activists. Not that that was anything particularly new. I mean, that that's since the founding of this country, indigenous activists have been a target of, of RCMP or CSIS surveillance, but, but Harper had intensified it in a special way. And, um, and similarly, um, you know, some of the work I've done on, on, on pipelines has uh, emerged from the fact that, um, you know, movements were starting to form uh, to uh, prevent the construction of pipelines that would really just lock in the continued extraction 
of uh, the tar sands and of oil um, for uh, decades into the future. Um, and as these movements to, um, to stop these pipelines emerged, um, there were all kinds of uh, needs journalistically, I think that, um, that were evident, right? Um, investigations into how the federal government at the time uh, was basically turning the apparatus of the state into uh, uh, a sales operation uh, for the tar sands internationally. Um, and so I, I worked to try to uh, expose and explore the mechanics by which they did that. Um, and there was also a need, I think, apart from the investigative work, a lot of the work I've tried to do is just to um, amplify the entirely righteous perspective of social movements in places that they, that they, that, like the Guardian, that they may not um, get a platform. Um, because I think that the mainstream and corporate media, uh, one of their functions really is to vilify and invalidate the voices of, uh, of social movements. Um, and so I've tried to make what modest contribution I, I can to, to shifting that kind of um, incredibly lopsided um, a bias that exists. I think that's a very humble answer. I think it's been more than a modest contribution. You have inspired me and I think a lot of other people who might not know about these topics, but what has the general reaction been from Canadian mainstream public to some of these big exposés? Well, I mean, I know that when I was writing for The Guardian, one uh, common response that I found actually quite humorous was that a, a lot of people would exclaim, you know, thank God it takes an international outlet to, to, to you know, to expose these realities in Canada. Um, you yeah. know, which I found amusing because it was just little old me like writing from my desk in Montreal. Um, but because it had the imprimatur of the Guardian uh, and an international outlet, um, um, people felt an incredible kind of validation and confirmation um, uh, in their in their views, and uh, I think it spoke to just how little uh, the Canadian corporate media or the CBC um, actually uh, sheds light on some of those subjects. True that. Uh, what has the reaction been, sort of, in positively, and then consequently negatively? So by that I mean, have there been concrete policy changes? Um, social changes to our society based on some of your stories? And conversely, has there been a negative reaction from the powers that be government corporations? Um, well, you know, like when you're, when, you're, when you're advocating and writing in support of indigenous rights or, um, you know, suggesting that the, the, the dominant ideology of the age, neoliberalism needs to be overhauled, like it's not, Governments aren't exactly amenable to responding to that in the immediate. Um, so I and I think most of my journalism has tried to amplify radical ideas. They're not; those aren't those aren't um, ideas that you see leading to change overnight. Um, it sometimes takes decades. Um, so, but for instance, like you know, I, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I was writing about how important it is for environmentalists and for Canadians broadly to support indigenous rights and self determination not just because we owe a huge moral debt uh, to indigenous peoples, but because indigenous rights, if implemented, are one of the most powerful tools we have to fight endless extraction um, and to protect, protect the climate. And you know, 10, 12 years ago, that was a very marginal idea, um, but that has become far more mainstream now, you know, not just on my account, but the, on, on account of the, the work that social movements have done. But, you know, 12 years ago, there were, you could count them on, a, on your hand, I think, the, the, the journalists writing about that. Um, and, and I guess another example, perhaps, is the work that I, I did on the LEAP Manifesto, um, mm -hmm. which was uh, uh, a declaration issued by a coalition of social movements and, um, and activists and journalists. Um, and we, we put forward the argument that we can only address climate change, the climate crisis, uh, if we understand that it has to be done in a way that makes our society far more humane, equitable, abundant, um, 
And that idea, which was entirely marginal five years ago, uh, has now entered the mainstream through, in particular, the Green New Deal. Um, and you can trace a direct line of influence from, from the Green New Deal to, to the LEAP Manifesto. Um, and again, that's not, um, you know, we haven't yet in this country seen um, any kind of uh, serious, tangible shifts when it comes to climate policy. You, we've mostly seen the liberals co-opt a lot of that that language, um, but I do think the that that kind of work really helped lay the groundwork um, uh, for uh, movements to raise those issues in a more serious way, to to grow larger and more serious. And I think you know we to show the popularity of those ideas. I think we're in a much better place than we were five years ago um, to advance those those ideas. Mm -hmm. And then any sort of I don't know, death threats, hate mail, things that you've sort of had to endure yeah. as you try to bring these things to light. Yeah, I've gotten a few death threats and certainly threats of lawsuits. Um, uh, when I was organizing and writing about an, an, an indigenous community in, in, in Quebec, uh, the Algonquins of Barrier Lake who were um, fighting against clear cut logging and mining on their land, I was visited by a CSIS agent. Um, so, uh, that said, you know, I'm a white guy and so I'm pretty sheltered um, and I certainly don't face anything like what racialized and, and female journalists uh, do for advocating on similar, similar subjects. Um, but I tend to think that, you know, certainly like the, the, the visit from, from, from CSIS uh, spies, like that, that to me was um, a sign that I was doing my job right. Um, you know, more, more journalists should, um, should be being scrutinized by uh, the Canadian state and, and, and cast as, you know, subversive agents. I think we're doing our job well if that happens. Nice. Uh, you mentioned the liberals. You wrote a pretty, uh, let's say, intense, open, uh, thought-provoking, thought-provoking, I think would be a good way to describe it, book called The Trudeau Formula. Seduction, Betrayal in the Age of Discontent. I love that title. I think that's very creative. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the book, where the idea came about and, and sort of the, what you're trying to say? Well, when, I guess when Trudeau kind of like rode to power on his, you know, his, uh, his, uh, his horse, uh, um, you know, all gallant and romantic. And um, I think there was this like global, like, international like love in on him um and it felt like one of my beats journalistic beats at the time was just trying to spoil that kind of like global crush on trudeau um just you know pointing out the the far more um you know uh sordid kind of reality behind the the you know the shiny facade and um yeah i felt like it it would be useful to to turn that uh, into a book. Um, I, I found that I found that the, the, that brand of kind of progressive neoliberal politics that Trudeau represented, which is very similar to what um, Obama practiced. Um, in fact, he borrowed much from 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 Obama. Um, I, I felt it was very dangerous in that it 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 lulls people, especially lots of progressives, into complacency when that's the last thing we can afford right now. Um, it creates fallow ground for, for the right wing um, because people eventually discover that their basic living conditions aren't actually materially improved under, under liberals. Um, and I found that, the, that politicians like Trudeau aren't actually offering any real answers for the crises of inequality, colonialism, white supremacy, um, climate breakdown. And um, so I just wanted to write a book that would help um, arm people with um, a kind of clear, lucid understanding of what exactly the Liberal Party represents on, on behalf of whose interests they actually operate. Um, because I certainly know that, you know, I myself, when I was in my early 20s, mid 20s, um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly thought the Liberal Party had progressive aspects to them. Um, and I think, I think a lot of Canadians go, like we go through this on a, on a 
on a generational basis, you know, like um, liberals are really excellent at raising our expectations about what that party can accomplish on behalf of Canadians and then systematically uh, betraying uh, all of those um, um, hopes and ideals. Um, and it's literally part of their DNA to do that. And um, I just I just hope that uh, we might be able to skip a few cycles if if you know I write a book like that. Um, and uh, as I discovered, it's really interesting that like you know Trudeau's brand has certainly been sullied, but I think that in many ways the liberal brand is far more formidable and durable. Um, but I do think that if we don't chip away at their um, kind of armor that we will be stuck cycling between liberal and Tory governments in this country um, and not actually being able to provide Canadians who are overwhelmingly progressive and social democratic with the, uh, the kind of government that they, that they deserve. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because in Canada, we like to think we have a plurality of parties, political parties, but the reality is there's only ever been two federal parties who governed. And the excuse is always, if you don't vote, vote liberal, you're going to get these alt-right conservatives. So you have to vote us because we're better than the alternative, but there actually are other alternatives. And uh, there've been a lot of broken promises on electoral reform, environmental protection, indigenous reconciliation, clean drinking water. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, what has, I mean, for people who have these sort of rose colored glasses in terms of, of Justin Trudeau mania, how, what has that response been? Has it been a reality check or are they still whoosh, blinders? Or yeah. do you even know? I mean, it's a hard thing to gauge necessarily. Definitely, I've had some great responses from, from you know, progressive-minded liberals who who feel that it was, um, you know, a, a really helpful book. Um, I mean, I think we're swimming in in this country. We're swimming in liberal hegemony. Um, I mean, that that the the project of of um, of liberals in this country, which dates back to its founding, is a is a very durable, very durable and profound one. Um, uh, it, on the other hand, it is it is also quite fragile um, at the same time, um, in the sense that uh, I think it is, especially becoming more and more apparent to Canadians that uh, a lot of the answers that liberalism has um, are are not adequate, you know, to the the issues that we're we're confronted by. Um, and so I think we're in this interesting moment where liberalism probably has never been as weak um, as it is now, um, which I think it means that if we have the courage of our convictions and uh, give a compelling uh, basis to more radical ideas, um, I think we can have a lot of success at winning uh, people over. Um, I mean, the kinds of uh, new movements you're seeing, especially um, populated by young people, um, is an indication that a lot of the, the power of uh, those liberal ideas are, are, are really wearing off. Yeah, I hope so. I really um, relate to the new younger movements, environmental movements, social movements that are happening. So the fact that you are in touch with that is again, really inspiring to me. And so thank you for the work that you're doing there. Let's switch again to a little bit to the, the corporate news media versus independent news. You've been able to sort of um, work your way through both a little bit. Like you said, you kind of forced yourself into the corporate mainstay, even though they haven't published opt-eds. Uh, but what has your experience been like working with the powers that be the main corporate media? Well, I mean, the main, the main outlet I wrote for for the last several years was The Guardian, which you know, is in some ways unique among mainstream larger papers because it's a, it's organized as a trust. It's not a for-profit corporation. And so it's not subject to the same institutional imperatives and pressures that corporate outlets are, which is why it has a, a much broader range of permissible discourse uh, among its columnists, certainly. Um, uh, not that The Guardian is without, without its flaws, um, in particular, the 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 quite vicious uh, attacks that they were responsible for against Jeremy Corbyn and the and the Labour Party were were quite disappointing. Um, 
But so in many ways, the, and the Guardian also, unlike Canadian papers, has a far more crusading tradition. For instance, like editors and reporters at that outlet can uh, move between writing op-eds, opinion pieces, and uh, and news and reportage, which you'll never find in 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 Canada. Um, and as for outlets in Canada that I have written for mainstream outlets, I mean, I've been struck by their timidity um, and um, the the way in which uh, the right wing forces um, play a real disciplining um, force on the journalism that they, that they do. Um, and uh, yeah, I've never, I've certainly never felt that someone like me would ever be able to find a home in uh, a corporate outlet in, in Canada. They, you know, they're, they, they have no interest in, in journalists who um, are motivated by more radical ideas, uh, journalists who uh, want to target, focus their target on, um, you know, questions of corporate power. Um, there's no place for people like that. And, and there, there might have been places like the CBC were much more open to critical minded uh, progressive journalists 30, 40 years ago. There's far less space for that kind of journalism today. Yeah, I think it's important to pick up on that too. For Canadians who might think that the the corporate media has some sort of relationship to the public interest, that's not actually the case. Corporate media is beholden to its shareholders and to for-profit media and are often then dictated by the types of people who put in advertising dollars, who um, have a specific agenda. And that agenda, as I said, is not often in line with the public interest or disseminating news that should reach the public interest. And most of the Canadian outlets uh, are actually owned by six corporations. If you go high up enough through the lines and some of them are even these American trust hedge funds and all these other things. So um, I think it's important. And that's why I wanna have these conversations as well is to shed light on the information that we get as Canadians and why it's so important to seek other sources of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you, as you say, corporate, ownership of the media in Canada is even more concentrated than in the United States, which I think most people would, would probably find surprising. And uh, yeah, I mean, our, our, our largest national paper, the Global Mail, is owned by the richest man in Canada, who's worth $50 billion. Um, the interests of, uh, I mean, billionaires don't own newspapers out of the goodness of their hearts. Uh, you know, they want the world to reflect their interests and newspapers are uh, one way of getting that. And, uh, you know, they hire editors and managing editors uh, in their own image uh, who internalize their values and outlooks. Um, so no, um, the, the billionaire press that we have in Canada is not interested in um, doing the kind of journalism that would uh, help the, or the ordinary majority in this country. Yeah, and my, my last little rant on that uh, subject too is that corporate media also does not do a great job of holding any political party or politician to account in the way that we think that the fourth estate should really work. Uh, and when newspapers put their, their weight behind a particular candidate, I think that is problematic. And when you have someone like Marcy Ian running for the Liberal Party when she used to host CTV you know, Canada AM, how can you hold this political party account to account and then run for the political party. So that's just something that, that blows my mind. But enough about corporate media. Um, you've also done a lot of work with independent media and progressive media in Canada. So what has your experience been like in that realm? Well, I was involved with a, a, a media project for several years called the Dominion and the Media Co-op, which was a, a plucky uh, left-wing uh, bi-monthly magazine and a kind of federation of uh, outlets uh, in four cities, uh, Montreal, Toronto, Halifax, and Vancouver, um, that was in some ways modeled after the indie media movement that emerged during the anti-globalization movement in the late 90s, which tried to create open platforms for um, uh, ordinary people to be, become empowered as journalists. 
And in, in the media co-op model, we had an open platform, open publishing model, but we tried to introduce some quality editorial controls. Um, uh, so it was a really interesting model. It was, it was, it was organized as a membership-based cooperative. Um, and what you're seeing now in, in a lot of the new wave of independent outlets is that uh, it's quite common now to have membership-based media. Um, so in some ways we were a little bit uh, too ahead of our time um, and the project didn't, didn't, didn't uh, survive in, in, in its kind of original uh, form, um, but it did train a lot of young left-wing journalists uh, who have now gone on to do other work. Um, I actually think it's a really exciting time for independent media in this country. There's a bit of a renaissance happening, I think. Um, you're seeing new outlets like uh, the Narwhal, Candleland, um, Rank and File, Passage. Um, there's also a whole new wave of podcasts um, like the Harbinger Network, uh, like Indian Cowboy, um, Media Indigena. Um, there's some outlets that the Discourse Media and IndieGraph are incubating, um, like Indigenous News on the West Coast. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really promising moment, I think, where uh, I think in, 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 in large part in, in response to the failings of the, the corporate media model, um, uh, which is starting to crumble uh, in part because they're a capitalist model of advertising that, relied, that it relied on um, is being uh, ripped, from, ripped out from under it by uh, the new tech platforms, Google, uh, and Facebook. Um, so I think there's uh, a really exciting moment now um, where uh, I think you could see independent media outlets uh, grow to even greater influence than they have in the past. And I think play a, a, a really exciting role in uh, really shifting the entire uh, media landscape in this country. Yeah, I really hope so. And I'm, there's the Ricochet Media in Quebec, also uh, the Thai um press progress which you mentioned is associated with the ndp so there are these different outlets my question has always been if you're not government funded and you're not corporate funded then you have to look to the public for funds and then so in terms of funding independent media to me that's always been the challenge how to find sustainable independent funding that lets journalists have an independent voice without being beholden to advertisers government interests corporate interests, or even to some extent, the public interest in dictating, uh, you know, I didn't like this story, so I'm not gonna give you $10 a month anymore for my, my subscription. So I think that has been one of the biggest challenges, at least for me in trying to get into progressive independent media, um, just a side thought, but you are also doing some really interesting work and are going to be working with a bunch of other journalists, progressives, um, voices to provide a new platform. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? Sure. Um, I mean, just, just to speak to your last point, I do think that, that it's becoming more, um, it's becoming more of a reflex, I think, among media consumers, uh, Canadians, uh, to pay for their media, like on a subscriber or membership basis. Um, so I think that's quite heartening. Like you've seen the emergence of crowdfunding and, you know, Patreon models, um, whereby people are, you know, much more readily uh, support directly new media projects. So I think that is quite a heartening development. Um, there's also shifts that you're starting to see among, you know, more private sector, like foundations uh, are, are moving to fund journalism more so. Um, I don't know how much that money is going to appear for radical media projects, um, but there are some interesting shifts happening there. Um, I certainly think that there should be more public subsidy, government subsidy for independent media projects. Um, but what we've seen so far in this country is that a lot of the subsidies that are becoming available are mostly being uh, gorged by the existing corporate outlets who just have much more, much larger lobbying arms to, to, um, to get their you know, teeth into those, uh, those piles of money. Um, yeah, so I, I have been working with a, a group of journalists on a new media project. Um, we felt that there were some gaps in the ind independent media landscape in Canada that needed to be filled. One of them was video platforms, um, you know, which have generally been dominated by the right. Um, we felt that there was a real need for more uh, 
you know, uh, antagonistic uh, to power investigative journalism, uh, which we need more of in this country, and also analysis that is responsive to the needs of social movements. Um, so we'll have writers and commentators like Pam Palmiter, Aziza Kanji, Russ Daibo, Al Jones, Abby Lewis, Linda McQuaig, uh, offering radical, but we hope rigorous um, journalism that amplifies the perspective of movements that, um, that also I think importantly does the kind of storytelling that helps people realize that radical change is possible, that it's necessary, and even that it's uh, irresistible. Um, because I think that is one of the key um, obstacles we have in this country to change, uh, that people really don't think change can happen. Um, and I think journalism can play a key role in helping people convince, helping convince people that it is in fact possible. Wow, thank you. I wish the, the new venture the utmost success. I will be following all of your work as you go. Martin Lukash, the author of the Trudeau formula, Seduction and Betrayal in the Age of Con Discontent, The Leap Manifesto, co-authored. All the links will be provided in the description below. I would strongly encourage you to read his work. Some of the news stories are readily available in Google and all over the internet. Type it in. They're very informative. They're very valuable. And the work that you're doing has been incredibly inspiring to me and I think to many, many other Canadians. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Well, thank you, Justin, I appreciate that.